What we're going to take a look at now is the bit of P7 that typically I would leave to last on the course. And the main reason I leave this area to last is because it's current issues, and the later we leave it, the more likely we are to have seen an article from our examiner, which might be a clue as to the current issue that might come up this time. Now, we don't always get an article, which helps us out in advance, so sometimes you'll have to walk into the P7 exam knowing that she's going to ask you something about something going on at the moment, but you're not entirely sure what it is. The good news for this sitting in June is that we have had a couple of articles that are relevant to our course. Whether that means they are coming up is no guarantee, but given that the articles are very relevant to what's been going on in the world over the last year or so, I think we're in with a reasonable chance of something. So what I'm going to do is talk about some of the current issues in the world of auditing. I'm not going to talk about too many of them because this is almost guesswork as to what you might test, but I will say a few words about those two articles, which I'm hoping you've already read. If you haven't, make sure you do. They're in the March and April 2009 student accountant. So, what should we start with as a current issue? Well, the first one I'm going to talk about is so current, I actually read an article about it only three days ago in the newspaper. Auditor liability. Now, I qualified in 1995, and when I was taking my exams, I was told that auditor liability was a current issue. It seems to have been a current issue forever. And there's a very strong reason for that. Uh, it's something we actually saw earlier in the course, because we did cover auditor liability, and that's one of the reasons I'm not going to say too much about it now. The fact is that ever since the late 1980s, audit firms have found themselves being blamed when companies go bust and shareholders lose their money. The general argument is that the auditors should have realised that the company was in trouble, that its accounts were painting far too optimistic a picture, and should have said something in their audit reports far earlier than they ever did, if they ever said anything at all. Now, as I hope you remember from earlier in the course when we studied this area, there was a time when auditors did not just have to worry about the shareholders suing them, but other third parties as well. That is still a potential danger, but the disclaimer paragraph that audit firms now like to put into their audit reports might, or maybe probably, will stop third parties in their tracks. The real talking point at the moment is, should auditors be allowed to limit their liability, their exposure, to shareholders? If shareholders lose $5 billion when a company collapses, and if it turns out that the auditors did get it wrong and should have warned the shareholders earlier that the accounts were not correct, not true and fair, should the auditors pay the entire $5 billion? That is our problem. It links into another current issue on the course, because if an audit firm was found guilty and told to pay $5 billion, you would be looking at an ex-audit firm, because that would kill them, whichever audit firm they are. They simply don't have the funds or the insurance cover to pay $5 billion. So this is a pretty serious issue. As we saw earlier in the course, audit firms have argued that if they're guilty, okay, they're guilty, and they should pay something. But it doesn't really seem fair that if the directors screw up a company, and the auditors screw up in not telling anyone that the directors are doing it, well, there are two guilty parties here. How come the auditors end up paying all the money? So audit firms have been arguing for ages that, OK, if they have to pay something, they should pay something, but it should be fair. Over the last 
10, 15 years or so, various potential solutions have been suggested. But before we get to the solutions, there is an underlying question that should be asked here as well. Should auditors be allowed to limit the amount that they pay out? Well, in most countries, auditors are not allowed to limit how much they might pay out. And even in those countries where they can limit it, typically the law states that if it turns out the auditors were completely guilty, any limiting agreement is likely to be torn up by the judge anyway. So, should auditors be allowed to limit their liability? The main couple of arguments against this seem to be that if you allow auditors to limit their liability, might that take a bit of the pressure off and might they not try quite so hard to get the audit right? Well, even if you limit your liability, we're still talking about millions, if not hundreds of millions of pounds, so I think that's a slightly unlikely argument, but we'll note it down anyway. And I suppose the other argument is that the poor old shareholders who've lost all their money might not get much of their money back. If they can only get that amount back from the auditors, what if they can't get back any other losses from anyone else? The shareholders may well lose out. And it seems a bit unfair, if they're totally innocent, that they are the ones who lose. But that second argument seems a bit ridiculous as well. Just because we want the shareholders to get their money back is not an argument that any old person should pay them. If the auditors are not completely at fault, then why should they have to pay the shareholders? Let the government pay the shareholders, if that's the argument you want to take. So there are also quite a few arguments that suggest audit firms should be allowed to limit their liability. Some seem to think that it's worth suing the auditors because the auditor's insurance company, trying to avoid the publicity of a court case, will tell the audit firm it's probably best just to pay these people to go away. And that, it has been argued, means that so many extra people are suing the auditors when it's just not right to do so. So maybe that's an argument. A second argument, and probably the main one, is that it's simply not just the auditor's fault. Now, if that's what we believe, maybe that is telling us a potential solution to this. Maybe what we should do is say to a judge in a court case, if the auditors have done the audit wrong, take a look at where you think the overall blame lies, and if you think the auditors are 60% to blame for the shareholders' losses, 
Maybe the auditors should pay 60% of the shareholders' losses, and the other 40%, well, that depends who else is to blame, probably the directors. This concept of a sort of proportionate liability sounds like quite a nice idea, and the audit firms are quite keen on it, presumably because they think a large percentage of the blame will not be attached to them. The problem is how do you decide who is actually at fault? So it's a nice answer in some respects, but potentially a very difficult one to work with, although some countries do have this in place. But there is another argument here, and it's a sort of practical argument. If we don't let audit firms limit their liability, there is a danger that one big legal case could wipe out a firm of auditors. Well, if they're guilty, who cares, you say? They should be wiped out. Well, maybe, but the big concern is that the audit industry is dominated by a very small number of big firms. In Britain, for example, we have the big four. And if that were to become the big three, the amount of choice available to the biggest companies when looking for their audit firms and advisors would be very limited, because most big companies seem to think that only the big four can supply them with the services that they need. So maybe for the good of the industry overall, and for the betterment of competition and choice, it is worth allowing audit firms to put some sort of ceiling on their liability so they know they're going to survive, even if they're found guilty of really mucking up an audit. We'll talk more about lack of competition shortly, there are potentially other solutions to it, but that seems to be an argument that is winning over quite a few governments who are very nervous about the lack of competition at the top end of the market. So as a result of that, and other arguments, in the 2006 Companies Act in the UK, audit firms have now been told that they can sign liability limitation agreements with their clients before they start the audit work. At the time of filming this, I'm not aware of any big company that has actually agreed to sign one of these. Now, that might be because the audit firms have asked and the company has said they'd rather not, and the audit firm has decided to go on with the audit anyway, or it may be that audit firms have not started asking yet because they're nervous about the response they might get. Who knows? But signing a limitation agreement would mean that the shareholders would have to give approval to it beforehand because it's their potential losses that they're potentially now going to lose. But it would mean that auditors could go into an audit knowing that even if they really mucked it up, that was the maximum figure it would cost them. Although bear in mind what I said earlier, any judge is likely to tear up that sort of agreement if it turns out that the audit has been done really, really badly, completely negligently, and maybe even illegally or unprofessionally. So there are some thoughts on auditor liability, and the reason it seems really current at the moment is because so many companies are in danger of going out of business in this recession, and some very big, multi-billion dollar companies have been going out of business, Everyone's been concentrating on bad directors. It won't be long before the first groups of shareholders start to ask, why didn't the auditors warn us that this bank's assets were overstated? And maybe we're going to see big audit firms hauled into the courtroom and told to defend the quality of their audit work. Now, no one's too sure what will happen with this. Maybe some will be found guilty, and given the size of the banks and the size of some of these losses, this could easily wipe out an audit firm or two. The audit firms in the UK have already realised this danger and have gone to the government and asked them to consider some sort of emergency legislation to help protect them. Who knows what's going to happen with this? 
But clearly, the going concern crisis in many companies is a very topical issue in the world. And whilst your examiner has already tested it a bit, it would not surprise me at all if she tested something like this again. Partly because of the articles that have been written in March and April, and more on that in a minute. So there we go. Auditor liability has been a current issue for as many years as I can remember, but it seems to be very topical right at the moment. We have new rules in the UK, and on top of that, we've got the world recession, which means companies will collapse, which means shareholders will lose, and they'll look to blame someone. The next issue I'm going to look at, well, actually two issues, is what's in the two articles from our examiner, in March and April 2009. We have two separate subjects, but they are very much linked. So what are those two subjects? One of the two articles takes a look at the new international auditing standard well, I say new, it was revised a little while ago, on fraud and the auditor's responsibility for that. The other article looks at earnings management or creative accounting, cooking the books, making things look a lot better or maybe making them look a lot worse than they actually are. Now, the two articles are very easy to read and fairly self-evident and I just want to make sure that we're all aware of the main issues in here. How is this linked back to audit liability? Well, of course, auditors' liability is in the news at the moment, largely because so many companies look like they're going to go out of business without the auditors having ever warned anyone that the accounts from previous years were maybe a little optimistic. So what? Well, when a company is in trouble, surely the chance of it trying to manage its earnings and make things look better than they actually are is going to be heightened. So maybe we have an exam question where there is evidence that the directors are trying to manipulate the profits upwards and the assets upwards and the liabilities downwards. And if they're trying to do that, it's probably because the company is in trouble. So maybe that's the story. There's a recession, company in trouble, oh look, there's evidence they're manipulating some of the figures. And if you're manipulating the figures in the accounts, or maybe leaving things out of the accounts altogether, like liabilities, what you're doing is not just earnings management or creative accounting, it fits in the definition of fraud. So both of these articles are sort of about the same thing. The main issue with the fraud article, looking at that one first, is highlighting the sort of change of culture regarding auditors and their responsibilities for finding fraud. There is an old saying that goes back to a court case in the 1890s where a judge said that the role of an auditor was that of a watchdog, not a bloodhound. Now what does that mean? Well, what the judge was getting at was this. What does a watchdog do? Well, it's a dog that keeps watch. In other words, it tends to sit outside a building and see if any trouble comes along. What does a bloodhound do? Well, bloodhounds are dogs that are used to go for sniffing. They go sniffing out trouble. And over the years, auditors have tended to feel that their responsibilities as far as looking for fraud in companies were concerned, 
their responsibilities were limited to carrying out the audit process, and if in carrying out the audit process, fraud came wandering along your desk, then you should do something about investigating it. But you would not feel you had a responsibility to actually go and look for fraud as such. Well, over recent years, it's become more and more obvious that this old saying from this judge over a hundred years ago is maybe not as relevant now as it once was. The fact is, auditors are expected to spend a lot of time understanding the company that they're auditing and the industry that it's in to try to understand the likelihood that the accounts could be wrong. And since one of the reasons the accounts could be wrong is that there are fraudulent transactions in there, or that fraudulently some transactions have been left out, it seems a bit odd to say that an auditor will sit there waiting for fraud to come along, when I think for many years auditors have tried to understand how a fraud could happen and then have gone to investigate to see if it has. I suspect that auditors have been more bloodhound and less watchdog for many years. And it seems that the new audit standard on fraud pretty much puts that into words, and that is the new impression we seem to get. So, auditors these days are expected to have a very deep understanding of their client, its business and the industry it's in, and should also spend some time at the start of an audit, especially for newer clients, trying to understand how fraud could take place, both financial fraud, theft, and also fraud in terms of accounting entries, how that fraud could take place and also why that company might be motivated to do it. So understand why they might have reasons for doing it. And having then understood all of that, that understanding should then direct your audit work. So there we go. When you are first taught auditing, you're taught that the external auditor has a relatively small responsibility to go looking for fraud whilst doing an audit. I suspect, in at least the last year or two, that that responsibility has gradually crept up. It's not helped by the fact that our increased responsibilities for digging out money laundering in companies, and fraud and money laundering are very closely related, means we have to have an understanding of clients and how this sort of thing could happen. So there we go, that's one of the articles looking at fraud. The other one doesn't really need me to write anything up here. It's a very straightforward article to read and it's about earnings management. Pointing out to you that one of the faults of international accounting standards especially, 
is that in order to try to persuade many countries to use the standards, they are in many places relatively generous in the number of options they give you as to how to account for something. The danger, therefore, especially in a recession, is that directors are searching through the allowable accounting treatments, not trying to find the most appropriate for the circumstances, but trying to find the most appropriate one that will increase the profits the most. And that is not how you're meant to choose your accounting policies. It's meant to be the most appropriate for the situation. So because of that, auditors at the moment should have a heightened awareness that if any of their clients are changing the way they account for things, it may well be they're changing, not for the right reasons, but for reasons of maximising profits. And that is not allowable. The problem is, how do you explain to a client that whilst their accounting treatment is allowed by the accounting standard, you don't agree with it? Presumably, the only argument that you can keep repeating over and over to them is that the rules say you're meant to choose the best treatment. And just because this one is acceptable, it doesn't mean it's acceptable in this situation. So there we go. A couple of articles from our examiner. And it would seem that's got a fair chance of appearing somewhere within one of the questions. And my guess is that one of your case study scenarios this time, question one or two, will have a company that has got a few problems, financial problems. And that's how that stuff will probably be factored into the story. The final subject that I'm going to take a look at, well, we look at current issues now, is again an issue that has been around for many years. And it's a major, major issue. Back when I was training as an accountant, there was the big eight. Eight big firms. It wasn't long before the big eight had turned into the big six. And then the big six became the big five. And then Enron happened, Andersons collapsed, and the big five firms became the big four. Now, it's worth stressing that in different parts of the world, it's not necessarily a big four. There are some countries, Japan, America, where there are additional big firms who don't have a presence in the UK, for example. But generally speaking, it's accepted that in most major economies, the audit market, and in fact the financial services market in a more general sense, is dominated by a very small number of firms. And the main concern is that where you don't have that many firms, well, it's a bit like a monopoly, isn't it? A lack of competition tends to mean quality can go down, prices can go up. Is there any evidence that that has happened as the number of big firms has gone down? Well, unfortunately, as the number of big firms has gradually got smaller, it's happened pretty much at the same time that lots of major legal cases have happened against firms of auditors. So it doesn't exactly look good, does it? Whether that is because quality has come down, or maybe it's because companies pushed themselves too far in the 1980s and then collapsed, or maybe it's because of other reasons. Who knows? But the fact is, a lot of people look at the number of legal cases and the lack of competition and say the two things must be linked. Have prices gone up? Well, they have. But the problem is it's very hard to decide the reason why the prices have gone up. Bear in mind, in the last few years in the UK... We've had to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley, affecting companies with American listings. And on top of that, we've had increased corporate governance to deal with. And on top of that, we've had the shift from UK accounting standards to international accounting standards, all of which have surely increased costs of doing professional work for companies. So it's very hard to judge that. But that, those are a couple of the potential problems with a lack of competition. But they aren't the only problems.
Imagine your current firm of auditors is KPMG. But you've decided that maybe for quality issues or maybe because they've been your auditor for a long time, it's time for a change. So if you're a very big multinational company, there's a very strong chance that you feel that the only firms of auditors who can satisfy your needs are the big four. It won't be KPMG, of course, because you're getting rid of them, so there are three firms left. But what if Deloitte already do your internal audit work for you? Well, you don't really want to get both lots of auditing done by the same firm, self-review threat and all that, so that's probably that out of the way. And what if you get corporate finance work done by Ernst & Young? You may find that because of the other services and the other firms you're using, you may have no choice at all. You may be stuck with only one other firm you can take. And I suppose we could then extend the situation and say that in some circumstances, you may be forced to use a firm who, for independence reasons, ideally you shouldn't be using. And that would be a major problem. So we've got some fairly clear problems with this. But audit firms will point out that they have to be big because big gives you benefits. For example, they argue that being a big firm of accountants should mean that if their big client shouts at them and tries to get them to change their mind, because of their size, they're in a better position to stand up for themselves. Okay, fair enough. It's also argued that the biggest firms, because they're similar sizes to big banks, although in the current recession they're probably a lot bigger than the now fairly small banks, it means that when people are coming out of university and looking for jobs, the big firms of accountants can compete with the big banks and therefore attract the top talent to the audit industry. There has been a feeling that over the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of the best people coming out of universities are tempted to work for banks rather than audit firms. And only the big audit firms can probably afford to pay the sort of salaries that might tempt people back from the banks. Whilst that has been an argument, I suspect that in 2009, when students come out of university, the chance of them wanting to work for banks is significantly decreased. Further, it's also pointed out that big firms of accountants, because of the resources they have, are far more likely to have lots of specialists who can therefore deal with the bigger clients' individual needs. And as well as having lots of specialists, they also have the money to spend having research departments trying to look for how auditing could get better. So there are some pluses and minuses here, but many people point out that it's not the existence of big firms that is the main problem, it's the fact there aren't enough of them. And many people argue that as the gap between the big four 
and the other firms just beneath that gets bigger and bigger, the chance of the other firms also getting big and therefore increasing competition is gradually going down. We need to do something about this now or we're going to end up with four super firms and everybody else with no chance of them ever catching up. Question is, if we all agree, as many seem to, that only having four big firms is a problem, how do you solve that? Potential solutions. How about taking the four big firms and cutting them all in half? Somehow. So you would have KP, MG. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting idea. And it would, of course, mean you'd now have eight firms competing. And those eight firms would actually not be that different a size to the current firms who are just outside the big four. So, in fact, you wouldn't just have a big 8, you would probably have something like around about a big 10, 12, 15, all competing with each other. Now, that sounds like quite a nice result. The problem is that in order to have this, because the big 4 don't want to break up, you would have to have some fairly severe government intervention forcing them to do it. And in most capitalist economies, the government does not want to intervene in an industry. So, interesting idea, but fairly unlikely to happen. Another possibility is to say to firms 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in the list, why don't you merge with each other? But the problem is, even if firms 5 and 6 chose to merge, and bear in mind at the moment, they are in competition, so that would seem fairly unlikely, even if they merged, they'd still end up being slightly smaller than the big four. And of course, a lot of these firms have big histories and personal identities. They don't want to merge with anybody else. There's another interesting solution to this as well. In the United Kingdom, the government pays millions to the big four firms in fees for all sorts of services. Well, one way to make the big four a bit smaller and the smaller firms a bit bigger would be for the government, for a period of time at least, not to pay the big four for anything and instead to give the work to the firms a bit lower down. Hmm, now that's quite a cunning tactic, isn't it? Because that, of course, might tempt the big four into agreeing to split some of their services up a little bit. Because they'd be worried about losing all of this lucrative work. Another possible part solution to this is something we saw when we looked at groups. Maybe all the big companies should be told that they must be audited by two firms in combination, a joint audit. Now by doing this, if the rule said that at least one of the two firms must not be one of the big four, it would still allow the smaller firms to get experience and exposure to auditing the world's biggest companies 
And that would make it easier for them to tender for audits on their own at some point in the future, because on their CV, if you like, they would have recent experience auditing big companies. The concern at the moment is that a big company won't choose Grant Thornton because they'll look at Grant Thornton and say, well, when did you last audit a big company? You don't know what the issues are. If we could somehow keep these firms involved for a little while, maybe that would help. So there we have it, the potential problems of a lack of competition in the audit industry. Studies and investigations into this research has been going on in the UK, in Europe and worldwide. It's clearly a big issue. The main problem we have at the moment is that whilst everyone agrees that something probably should be done, no one has yet come up with a convincing solution as to what actually should be done. Well. We've not looked at too many current issues because it's such hit and miss exercise that I could quite easily end up filming for many, many hours and giving you lots of interesting stuff to listen to and then none of it comes up. My best advice, keep making sure you're reading the financial press, the business pages. Go and have a look at the institute websites like the ACCA. Make sure you're aware of what the latest news is on there just in case. You're not going to get masses and masses of current issue stuff on the exam paper, but something of a current nature is likely to be there.